And now we are gonna move ahead. So to bring everybody up to date, we have been going through, we're in the process of figuring out who are we. And not just who we are as this individual, as Kim, as Eric, as Skip, but who are we as Christians? And so we went uh, back to the beginning, back to basics. And we kind of took chunks of the Bible, right? And, and the things that we could lump together, we did. We got through the first five books, mostly uh, of those Hebrew scriptures. We got through those. We talked about uh, being Abrahamic religions. We moved on into the New Testament and talked about each gospel and Acts. And then we talked about the letters. And today we are just going to touch on, on Revelation. And here's what I need you to know is I cannot explain Revelation in under 10 minutes. Okay? So you are going to get the the snapshot right and um i'm sure because there were others other books that people were like you know i'd like to dig deeper into that so that will come at some point but right now we're just doing snapshots um it's hard to take what you know from um from the resources you have sometimes and and make them concise but if anybody really wants to read about Revelation, this is an amazing book by N.T. Wright, great theologian. It's called Revelation for Everyone. It's like he's sitting in the room talking to you. So he's explaining um, the things. That's, that's one good one. And we're going to um, end with just a message out of the end of that book. And then this is another one, a little bit more uh, academic, but still not overly so by Warren Carter and Amy Jill Levine, uh, The New Testament, Methods and Meanings. So it goes through every book and tells you a little bit like, what kind of genre is it? When was it written? Uh, what is the message that came through here and how did the people then interpret it? So another good book. Um, and we've got a little bit out of that as well. But first we're gonna start, and, and like I told Maylee, Revelation does the first thing my rev, my we have a class, as you're being educated for this, you have a class solely on Revelation because it's so... So, Revelation, and that's the first thing the professor said, Revelation, no, but no S's in here. Um, so remember that, and it's because it is one Revelation, right? One Revelation. Um, it is most probably written by A. John, but not the John we think of uh, as the disciple, but another John. Remember uh, when we, why we often say Jesus Christ or Jesus the Christ or uh, Jesus from Nazareth. There's a lot of Jesuses at the time that, who have those names. There's a lot of Johns. There's a lot of Marks and Matthews. So sometimes it's hard to set these folks apart. And um, this is either uh, he's also called John the seer John the divine different um, just different names to try to set him apart from the other Johns that they might have known at the time um, the tradition is that this book was written in the late 90s but recently after some more scrolls have been found there's been further research they really think it might be like late 60s so even before some of the gospels were written so consider that probably prob possibly right around the fall of the temple right of jerusalem possibly right around then um and it was written probably in ancient turkey just because of the words that are used and the and the way it's written it's language from that area that that language is written in in the original text now, it is an apocalyptic writing, okay? It's an apocalyptic book. Now, that doesn't mean that it's all gloom and gloom and all the things, right? Because apocalyptic just means it's something, it's that a revelation, it's something new. Now, our, um, our language is really hard. The English language sometimes is hard to say words and and we'll talk about a little bit about some of the words that are used for revelation how sometimes it's hard to understand them in english which we've talked about before um 
The ancient Jewish tradition did not believe that there was a separation between earth, between us, and heaven, and that there was this big firmament in between, right? They believed that we coincided, that, that things were, uh, were not separate, but instead were melted and merged together. So again, that leads us to help us interpret what they saw this book as being. Now, the ancient Jews also struggled because they, there are, there are multiple sides to this story, right? And they struggled to see which one was the one they were really supposed to understand because they only wanted to understand one story, right? It's like us, we, we like, I mean, I do. I like my side of the story, right? The way I interpret things. And I'm sure you're the same way, but they were having a hard time having an open mind to be in discussion about what that could be. So they struggled according to their traditions, according to uh, their theology, that, and some had no theology. Remember, we're in this time of flux in that first century. They might not have been Christ followers or Jews, but were instead people that were considered of no religion or had a pagan, what we call now, a pagan religion, right? At the time, it wouldn't have necessarily been a pagan religion. It would have been one other than the, the accepted religions. But there's four things that Revelation does tell us. Um, and, and in the story, repetitively throughout the story, we hear these things, that the story comes from God, goes through an angel, goes through John, and goes to the churches, right? Now, we hear him talk about, we heard uh, Keaton read about the seven churches, but it wasn't just to the seven churches. Yes, it went specifically to that, but that's really only the focus of like chapter two and three, right? The rest of the revelation, as well as those letters, went to all the churches that they could touch with that story, that they could deliver to that story. So um, we often like to just put, you know, put things in the little boxes and, and these boxes are more like that big refrigerator box instead of the little gift boxes that we stuff inside of it to keep for, that we never use for the Christmas gifts we think we're going to use, right? So this is the big box. Um, first of all, it is a letter. And that's, you know, not to just the seven churches, but to all churches after it had been given to those seven. Uh, it's prophecy. So John is pulling from the... Um, from the history that he knows, right? He's pulling from the traditions. He's pulling from the life that he lived as a person of faith. And um, he's doing this because, and he's, he's calling to God to, you know, give him a word because he is a prophet of God's purpose. Not his, not Christian, not Jewish, not pagan, not anything else. Of God's, God's purpose. So witness is that one of those words that is really hard to, to make a distinction of from uh, original language to today's language, to English, okay? To American English especially. Um, but, so... Witness means both witness, you know, being in the presence of, but it also means testimony, right? This, this original word that we use as witness also means testimony. So that means not only are you to see and hear, bring in, work it through, struggle with it, but you are to witness to your account, to give it to others so that that word passes throughout, right? But the most important is that Jesus, this is, this is the fifth thing, most important is that Jesus is central. Jesus is central to the whole story. 
Because what do we know about Jesus? Jesus was God's purpose, right? His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. That was God's purpose to be able to give to God's people that gift that came through resurrection, which was, and through Jesus's life, which was the redemption of us, our, the grace that was given to us, the love that was given to us, unfettered by any other tradition, just God's purpose. Now, what we often don't hear when we talk about all these things, right, is hope hope. Do you see hope in Revelation? Do you see hope in what can be a very scary sounding scenario? Do you, do you hear that? Because it's in there. See, the, the Jewish people are, are looking for hope. Now, there's two ways to look at this. One is this hope was a prediction. Okay? It was a prediction um, that only wanted to connect with history, with what had happened before, and make the story be more capable of being part of a history story. But first century, and, and rightfully so, because first Christian, first century Christians would have seen um, this as as the um, as Nero, who was trying to control everything, right, as being the bad guy. In Revelation that's what they would have seen now see we see it in the 21st century and even the 20th century um, as something completely else every time it moves the story moves to another set of people we lose just a little bit of the original intent but we know scripture is living right we know the word is living so we continue to try to work it out and how it looks in our lives the other thing that shows hope is proclamation. And that would have made sense in the first century. People would not have been, they would have been scared in the first century instead of uncomfortable. So if they were going to set out and say, Jesus is the central part of this story and Jesus is my savior, yes, there's some... There's retaliation from government authorities that were scared of this, right? And scared of this power. But they did it anyway. As, as time has gone on, the reason we don't witness as much, do the witness part, uh, do the testimony part, right? We, we're pretty good at the witnessing part. We can see, we can hear. The testimony part is hard because we feel uncomfortable. We're afraid we'll be ri ridiculed. And this story is here to say that, but this is, this is God's, this is God's plan, God's way of doing things, God's promise to us. And how can we not, how can we not witness to those things? So I just want to share a tiny little bit in this, let's do this one. When When God chooses, he also redeems. He also works in people's lives. And the miracle of the divine with the human relationship, the divine human relationship, from the very beginning was always has always been that human thought, will, and action is somehow enhanced rather than being canceled out by the divine power. So, this looking for God's purpose in our lives and in the world is a part of our relationship with God. But that doesn't cancel out our relationship with God if we share it with somebody else. It is meant to be um, together, to be um, pulled together in that. Um, and the last, I just, one little thing at the end as we're looking at how it is that that it that we take this in 
and what does revelation mean and how can I decipher it? Here's some things that I'd like you to remember. This book has been a revelation of Jesus, God's purpose. Read that in Jesus. A testimony to Jesus, God's purpose. An act of homage to Jesus, God's purpose. This word, revelation, this book, this prophecy, listen to the bells. Remember you talked about the bells ringing? Listen to the bells coming soon. This Jesus. We often, so often, look for Jesus in the clouds and forget to look for him in each other and in our world. So in the midst of us trying to figure out what all the things mean, we just have to remember that Jesus is our purpose. 